Good morning, my name is John Lux and I'm the Executive Director of Film Florida. Welcome to the follow-up to our virtual town hall to discuss Film Florida's recommendations for clean and healthy production sets. Because of the overwhelming request for input from medical professionals on set and otherwise, today we talk with medical professionals about COVID-19 on production sets and potential processes and procedures to ensure that cast and crew stay safe and healthy on set. Hopefully everyone was with us for our first town hall, but if you weren't, please check out the video on our social media pages and our YouTube channel. Since most of you probably were on that first town hall, we're gonna skip most of the boilerplate and jump in right into the discussion. Before we get going though, I wanna thank once again, Film Florida President Bonnie King for allowing us to work on this important initiative. I also wanna thank Sandy Leiterman, Flip Ramos and Gerardo Lopez for their continued support in this entire process. And thanks again to Gerardo Lopez for providing technical support for the discussion. Audience members, please use the question and answer function in Zoom. We'll be collecting those questions and we'll address them with our panelists as time allows. When you submit a question though, if your question is for someone specific, please let us know that. Also, please type your questions in full sentences because we're going to need to know what you're referencing since we're gonna answer questions a little bit out of order. As you know, we at Film Florida are not medical professionals. So we'll leave those, to the, those questions to the panel so we're, that we're lucky to have today. So let me introduce them to you now. Dr. John Norris is the Chief of Staff at Lower Keys Medical Center. He's a specialist in internal medicine in Key West and has been practicing for more than 30 years. Pat Seltz is a retired Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Captain after spending 35 years on the team. He started Movie Medics, which provides first aid and water safety to the motion picture industry. In his 38 years in business, he has served as a set medic, water safety driver, stuntman, stunt coordinator, marine coordinator, actor, and taught scuba lessons to actors. His three children, Brandon, Brittany, and Brianna, have also worked as medics and water safety drivers. And speaking of Brandon, Brandon Seltz is a state certified paramedic, and he's also a registered nurse. He's a firefighter and paramedic with the Miami-Dade Fire and Rescue, and he's been working in the film industry as a set medic for more than 10 years. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for joining us. Um, the, the question right now is, is not, do we open up, do we move forward? Moving forward is a given, and getting back to work is, is also a given. So the question is, how do we do it safely? What tools do we need to proceed in a smart manner? That's what we hope to talk about today. So Brandon, I wanna start with you. You mentioned in a previous discussion that our industry is considered low risk. Can you talk about what exactly that means? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so low risk, um, and this is defined by uh, OSHA, okay? Um, how OSHA classifies uh, worker exposure. Um, the level of risk depends uh, on the industry type the need for contact within six feet of people known to be suspected of being infected with COVID <clears throat> or requirement for repeated or extended be or suspected of COVID. Okay, um, just to go over the different uh, classifications, you have uh, very high, high risk, medium, and low risk, which will be us. Um, and again, I'll, I'll go through these, these, uh, these levels real quickly just so we have an idea. Um, a very high exposure risk. Um, these are your healthcare workers, your doctors, nurses, uh, paramedics, uh, EMTs, the ones that are uh, performing aerosol generating procedures on suspected or positive COVID patients with the positive patients, but not necessarily performing those, those high risk procedures. Someone who's in a medium exposure risk, um, those jobs uh, require frequent or close contact with uh, people who may be infected, but are not known to be infected or suspected uh, COVID patients. Um, these are industries uh, basically where there's a lot of interaction with the general public, uh, you know, schools, high population density work environments, um, some high volume retail settings. And then we have low risk, which will be us. Um, lower exposure risk jobs are those that do not require contact with people known to be as respect or suspected of being infected with COVID, um, nor is frequent close contact uh, of the general public required. Um, so that's, that's where we would fall, fall into uh, according to these OSHA uh, classifications. We're not going to be interacting uh, with the public. We're on closed sets and we're definitely not going to be um, 
you know, performing the same tasks as, uh, you know, the medical professionals out there in their setting. So Pat, looking at our industry from your experience, what areas are especially susceptible to germs being passed? I think, uh, good morning, everybody. And again, thanks for having me here. Sorry, I missed uh, the last town hall. But my experience where things could pass would be through catering. In the, in the catering tent, it could be through hair and makeup trailer because high volume, people are very close, a lot of countertops, uh, certain tools could be used and touched by a few people. And uh, just working with uh, certain equipment out there. Uh, Brandon, anything else you want to add there? Um, no, I mean, he pretty much, you know, touched on it. Yeah. Any area where you're going to have a, a large congregation of people or, or where you're going to have, you know, people are going to be not necessarily forced, but people are going to have to work in close contact with, with each other. That's, those are the areas you're going to see, um, you know, I guess the, the riskiest areas of, of transmission. And Dr. Norris, uh, thanks again for joining us. And we've talked a lot about um, personal responsibility uh, in terms of, you know, people taking care of themselves. Talk about what actions, um, you know, people can specifically take for themselves to reduce the risk as much as possible. And make sure you unmute your microphone there. Okay. You can hear me okay? Sounding good there. All right. Um, when it comes to personal responsibility, you're really being responsible for others around you. 30% of the people with COVID-19 are completely asymptomatic. Not even the West Wing of the White House is able to keep uh, those, uh, the, the virus out of the West Wing. So that's with Secret Service and things we don't know. So the most important thing to realize that if uh, a member of your team, a member of your set, uh, has a sore throat, a cough, a runny nose, even if they have a history of allergies and so forth, it should be considered to be a threat because if three to five days from now, suddenly they're febrile or they're short of breath, you now have a condition where one person can spread a great deal of disease very quickly. As demonstrated in South Korea, they were able to track one party goer who went to seven different bars and uh, days later was sick. So they accessed his cell phone, went to the cell towers, saw who was around that person during his um, previous week and identified 1,500 people who they tested. 119 had fresh infection after they had pretty much smothered COVID-19 there. And that's from one person without a mask who uh, basically didn't know that he had it. So when you sit down and our first speaker uh, very well states the OSHA statement, I mean, that was perfect, that uh, a low risk industry is absolutely a low risk industry. But when you talk about um, uh, how do you prevent this from taking out an entire team rather quickly? One of the most important things is for the team to be a team. That you guys have to be able to state that if an actor, actress, cameraman, or whoever starts to feel any illness whatsoever, they need to uh, step away from what they're doing and see a physician. Now, if it turns out that they, um, that, uh, they need to get swabbed, it turns out they need an antibody test, they need an antibody test, but antibody tests only tell two weeks later, which isn't a big help for you guys. So when it comes down to it, the most important thing is the personal responsibility of members of your team to say, hey, look, I need to step back for a second and be evaluated. Now, as far as the contact that our other speaker spoke about, um, the uh, trailers and so forth, all of you are probably thinking about the CDC coming out two days ago saying surfaces, uh, getting uh, disease from surface contacts is less likely. They didn't say it was impossible. His warning is absolutely correct that if you're in close contact in a uh, makeup trailer, well, you don't want to really go ahead and put blush or lipstick on, front, on one person and then use that same lipstick on the next person as an example. Um, there's no such thing as being perfectly protected for me, you, or anyone else. So when it comes down to it, 
uh, what I say to you is that personal responsibility is what is going to get us through this. That the distance, the OSHA guidelines, the statements from these two folks that are absolutely speak wisdom. Um, I, I'm pretty pleased to be sitting here and just listening. <laughs> and Brandon, you and I have talked a lot about personal responsibility as well. Do you have anything to add? Um, I, you know, going on the personal responsibility, I mean, he pretty much, uh, the doctor pretty much touched on it, you know, don't come to work if you're sick. Um, leave work if you think you're sick. Um, I know we all, you know, want to work. I know we've all, I'm going to make a general statement that, you know, we've worked maybe with, you know, not feeling 100%. Because, hey, I don't want to, you know, sit at home. You know, I, I need to be out and need to make some money. Um, but, you know, times are a little different right now. So, you know, to protect others, you know, as much as you don't want to get sick, you know, think about not getting everyone else sick. All right. Um, you know, that's where the personal responsibility comes in play. Um, think about what you're doing when you're not at work. Um, you know, don't put yourself in high risk areas or, you know, you don't want to be around a lot of people uh, potentially getting yourself infected. And then two days from now you have to go to work and then you're going to spread, you know, the infection around just, you know, we just need to think, you know, think a little bit about the little bit more about the things that we're doing at work, off of work, you know, and just, you know, overall general protection. Pat, I want to jump over to you. Do you think that every project should start with testing? Uh, I mean, I, realistically, if a project is, you know, two or three days, there probably isn't the crew size or the budget that would allow for that. But in terms of, you know, cr uh, projects that are a couple of weeks long or months long, should every project start with testing? When, when you're mentioning testing, like the swab test or the antibody test in that? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. And uh, right now, when you look at it, not everybody is getting tested. So it's a hard question to really answer. And then I don't want to get into legal questions or, or whatever. Maybe the doctor would know this more than most of us, but can they require us to have a test? Is it, is it legal to say, well, Pat Self, if you don't get this test, you're not, we're going to work on this production. So I, I don't know if, that would really be prudent to do, or if we would just take the basic steps of the questionnaires that, that they have out there. You know, have you been sick lately? Uh, ha do you have a fever? Have you had a fever? Uh, do you have any diarrhea? Or questionnaires that you could go through that maybe give you an idea, but I don't really know what the answer would be legally if productions or anybody could force you to have a test prior to have an going. answer all right in a situation like that that happened here in key west the question was whether or not to go ahead and mandate that the police fire ems do the testing one of the things that was stated uh, this morning on the radio as I was driving in, one of our county leaders uh, stated that if we mandated that, we'd be responsible for caring for the person uh, who was tested. So I'm not a lawyer, but I can just relate that. I can tell you that going back to personal responsibility for a moment, that if I knew I was going to be in close proximity with another individual, let's say for a second, an actor and actress have to have a, just a simple kiss. Um, they could go to uh, get screened on their own at a doctor's office or at uh, a pharmacy now, and they could be swabbed. Uh, well, they can't do that at the pharmacy. They have to do it at the doctor's office. They only do antibodies at pharmacies. Yeah, they could get swabbed, and then they could show each other that they have a negative test. You could kind of model it on the AIDS process with the porno industry. Uh, as far as uh, being re people having to take self-responsibility. So if you as an actor or actress has to get extremely close to another human being, especially their mouth, that the two of you have made a personal agreement to go ahead and to show each other papers before you go ahead and um, get that close. Now, one of the things I brought up on my iPad and the reason why you're on my phone is this is CDC guidance, and I'm hoping I got that centered well enough. 
If you look at the CDC guidance, it's very simple. It's dated May 6th. It says conduct daily health checks, conduct hazard assessment to the workplace, encourage employees to wear cloth face coverings in the workplace where appropriate, like the cast and crew, like we see on uh, the news shows when they show the people holding the cameras, implement policies and practices for social distancing in the workplace, improve building ventilation if it's possible. And then you talk to everything from administrative controls, engineering controls, and so forth. And that is freely available on the CDC website as far as guidance is concerned. But as far as testing is concerned, this is not four weeks ago when I was best be begging for uh, swabs to be able to identify. I right now uh, have identified myself about one sixth of the population of COVID-19 in Monroe County as a single doctor going out and hunting it. Uh, I would compete with the hospital for the numbers that I find. And I will tell you that a good number of people have absolutely no symptoms. And a six-year-old ran up to his door frame because I wouldn't go in the house. And I swabbed him. Uh, and he's looking at me going, I feel fine. I want to go out and play. I'm not sick. He lit that test. If you look at Monroe County's numbers, you'll see a six-year-old is positive for COVID-19. God forbid that kid went and played with his friends. And then they, those friends became infected and infected their parents and grandparents. So when it comes down to this, uh, I would tell you, even in a low risk uh, group like what you have, follow the CDC guidelines. I absolutely applaud the OSHA guidelines being discussed here. And I would say to you that uh, what, what my fellow speakers are stating is absolutely the truth, but I am not a lawyer. So when it comes down to whether or not mandating someone to get a test requires you to take care of that person until their condition is resolved, that is something that was suggested by our leadership as a reality. So police, fire, EMS, doctors, nurses, and respiratory techs are voluntarily getting checked, except at hospitals. Hospitals, we take care of our own. So Brandon, it, it, it appears that the first line of defense in, is a standard questionnaire before a project starts, emphasizing people not show up if they have any illness symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly daily temperature checks, but people have voiced concern about the, the temperature checks in, you know, how accurate are the, the, the temperature taking devices, workers taking fever reducing medications each morning to ensure they can work. What other symptoms would you be monitoring to spot people that may be ill? Um, you know, you're looking at the whole, you know, clinical picture of the patient. So, you know, definitely fever, you're looking at cough, shortness of breath, um, you know, headache, weakness. Um, these are all, you know, general symptoms of, of some sort of infection or that you're battling some sort of illness. Um, as far as the accuracy of temperature taking devices, you know, that's the responsibility of the, of the person ad administering that, taking that temperature. You know, you want to make sure you have a reliable device. You want to make sure that device is calibrated properly according to the manufacturer's specifications. Um, as far as someone taking fever reducing medication to, to pass, you know, the, the temperature check that we could go back to personal responsibility, you know, should you be doing that? Um, you know, they, someone who's just wants to, you know, hold it together just enough to, to, you know, do the, the, med, the, the temperature check, get into the set and then they start working, you know, like personal responsibility. Um, you know, that same person could have uh, voluntarily gotten a test a couple days prior and, and they could be positive for COVID, be asymptomatic, knowing that, and they could still come to work, personal responsibility. Um, so I think that about, I think that covers the, the question you would ask um, as far as how you would implement this. Um, you would definitely want to do this, you know, uh, first thing in the morning or, or before the work day starts, you would want to do it in an area that is isolated from, you know, the set or the work area somewhere that maybe there's, you know, a one way in a separate way out, you know, no one could get past this, you know, checkpoint until, you know, we do this, you know, quick temperature check, health screening, um, and so on, maybe give them a, an armband or something that says, Hey, you know, you, you, you pass, you're good to work, you know, go in, you know, go into the set. Now we could, you know, you could, you could go do your job and be around, you know, everyone else. 
Um, the questionnaire, uh, you know, definitely important. You could, you could obviously, you know, not tell the truth on the questionnaire. So we circle back to personal responsibility. Um, you don't want to get sick yourself and you don't want to get, you know, your fellow coworkers sick. Um, Dr. Norris, there's been a lot of talk in our industry about gloves. Um, but if you put on a pair of gloves and then touch something with a bunch of germs, uh, everything you touch thereafter with the gloves has the same germ. So are, are gloves giving people a false sense of security and are workers better off just constantly using sanitizing wipes, hand sanitizer, washing with soap periodically? Is that a better option? The recommendations from the CDC right now are hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. Use the soap, don't use the alcohol. If you have to use the alcohol, absolutely use the alcohol. But the gloves are known to cause people to think that they're wearing body armor. And what happens is you contaminate the glove and then people think they can wash the glove, but you can't really wash the glove. And um, it, what you need to do is you need to understand that gloves on this set should be thrown out constantly. One of the things about COVID-19 that you can remember from all the news in New York, Venice, China, is the amount of personal protective equipment, PPE, that we ran through. Um, in order to treat such a contagious disease as COVID-19, uh, you've got to constantly throw stuff out because if not, moments of dropping your guard make you vulnerable. The example that I always give people is the pens. Initially, when this whole thing started, the restauranteurs down in Key West, the bar owners, wanted to show me how well they were, you know, protecting their clients. So they brought up all the health codes that they deal with. And when they were done showing me a very thought out, sanitizing, their staff had gloves, um, I just asked them, who cleans the pens? Who takes care of the credit cards? Because you're exchanging that with the client and you're used to the idea that the food prep causes the risk of disease. Now it's the physical contact the clients can bring you disease into you. It had them stymied for a bit. So when we um, look at your question, basically, um, I guess I'll stop there with, with my response for now. But the most important thing to realize is that gloves um, give a false sense of security that hand washing constantly is, is very useful. It may be impossible on a set, especially with makeup and so forth. Alcohol may work better to some degree. You guys would be the experts on that, not me. But um, gloves, false sense. Uh, Pat, we had uh, alluded to an article that came out earlier this week where the CDC is now questioning how much a virus can actually be spread on surfaces. Given how much concern there is in our industry in terms of people touching equipment, or tools, how much concern should there be about sharing tools and equipment? And what precautions do you think need to be taken to ensure that germs aren't passed that way? You know, I, I was re reviewing some of the work or the information on the CDC and some other uh, information. And, you know, they talk about the disease could live on copper for up to four hours. It can live on stainless steel for, I forget the amount of time on that, but on plastics and paper, it could live up to a couple days. Uh, therefore, you know, we could say, hey, you can't pass this information, but it, uh, it seems like it all goes back to the personal responsibility. If you are touching something, and pass it on just just like here at my house. I, I got used to using the hand to wipe the doorknobs, to wipe the handrails on the stairway, and and things like that. And and I think again, this comes down to the personal responsibility that we should have some hand washing setups. If it's just a hand hand sanitizer, or if they do have those portable uh, hand washing machines that you see at some concert venues or, or large, large crowd gathering, uh, you can find some way or think of some way that you can disinfect this equipment. And, and it probably should be done often if this equipment's being used. But should they use the equipment? Probably not. But if they do, there should be some way that we can uh, sanitize it to where if somebody else does touch it, they don't have the issue. However, 
we got to get into the habit. All of us, you know, we're used to touching our face and, and doing this. So we have to become conscious. And again, it's back to us as individuals to protect ourselves and to protect others. See, I muted myself. Sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Norris, there's been, um, you know, some talk concerns about filming inside with air conditioning and how is that circulating some of these germs? What are your thoughts on that? Sorry, repeat your question. It was a little broken up. Okay, sorry about that. Um, there's been, while a lot of our production is outside, there's obviously a lot that goes on indoors as well. And so some people have voiced concern about uh, air conditioning systems circulating the germs as opposed to cleaning out air. Yes, no, it's a concern. As it stands right now, uh, you can um, uh, Google a uh, telephone center where in the telephone center, the um, uh, looked like you had 80 people sitting at different long tables inside of a room. And literally they show how the entire telephone center in a period of five work days, how about half the people contracted COVID-19. Now you can say coffee pots, water coolers, whatever, but the big concern in that group was uh, the ventilation inside the room. Then they also show another restaurant where tables um, in a restaurant, uh, people became infected. They literally did contact tracing, found out everyone who was there and tested them and came up positive. And I also brought up the nightclubs where people are close together and the ventilation off isn't, isn't wonderful. Uh, right now, there's not enough data for me to be able to tell you what the right amount of ventilation is. What does a hospital do? Hospital sets up negative pressure. Same thing we do with everything else. The air gets, um, it gets sucked out of the room through what's called a HEPA filter, which tries like an N95 to filter most of the biocontaminants and other contaminants out of the air. And then it literally shoots it out the door, uh, shoots it out the building. So we actually are sucking air from the, from the uh, rooms constantly. I'm not going to say that people can design those rooms on their sets and so forth. I have no idea what your ventilation systems are like, but I also state that the same way that Brandon brought up uh, OSHA, OSHA will come up with guidelines when we finally have some concrete information, but we don't have enough to say anything more than be careful, ventilate. And Brandon, along a similar line, uh, some questions have come in about bringing germs in on people's clothes or shoes. From your perspective, is that a concern on production sets? Um, you know, again, there's, there's, there's not a lot of data on that. There isn't evidence uh, that I'm aware of that supports the claim that, you know, you could track it in on, on clothes and shoes. Um, I think it's important to go back and look at how, how is COVID transmitted? Um, it's through droplets, right? Um, you know, so there, there, there's, there's, from what I've seen and, and you, know, uh, you know, maybe you guys can, can comment on that. There isn't the, the data to suggest that we're tracking in, you know, COVID on our shoes or it's on our shirts, you know, or how long does it survive in that environment um, when it's, you know, when, when the droplet lands on, on your, on your shirt. And, you know, on top of that, then from the droplet to get to your shirt, to another patient's, you know, mouth, nose, or eyes, you know, how does that happen? Um, I, 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 I can't say that, that it, that it isn't a concern. Um, but there's no, there's nothing that, that I've seen that tells me that it is, you know, it, it, that it's a big concern. And Dr. Norris or Patrick, anything else to add there? Patrick? The, the only thing that I read is they said that to be able to get this virus out of your clothing, you would have to be shaking it up possibly prior to putting it in a washer or something. But again, there's no real evidence that would suggest that. And uh, I, I haven't done any research as far as what the grocery stores are doing because you have a high amount of traffic going in and out of there. and even myself, when I've come back home from the grocery store, that's one thing that I've, I never really thought of was, oh, okay, did I get this stuff on my shoe? So, you know, there's just not a lot of evidence out at this point. 
Okay. Uh, what I would add to this is I'm a guy who's been on a COVID ward. I have been, I have seen people, I've been to people's homes who have it. I've been, I've seen them in the office, seen them in the ER, seen them on the hospital wards. I've seen them in the ICU and we've lost three people to COVID very sadly, but um, I've seen it through its spectrum. And I will tell you that um, when I come home from my high risk, not your low risk, from my high risk environment. I don't enter my house with my clothes on, which makes my neighbors interested. But, uh, and I mean that kind of tongue in cheek, but really I, I go to my back porch and literally strip off my pants, my shirt, take off uh, any exposed gear. I do not wear my shoes into the house because I've been in a high risk environment. If you guys are doing as uh, both Patrick and Brandon are stating, uh, low risk environment with people who are actually practicing good um, self hygiene. They're caring about being a member of a team, not just, you know, wanting to earn a buck, even if they have sniffles and coughing. Uh, in a situation like that, I would not get too crazy about where they walked and make them put on booties and do all those things. If you look at what the TV stations are doing, because there's a lot of experience there. I mean, just watching the Today Show every morning, I saw the way they originally separated their anchors, had them in different locations. One got sick. They're filming them remotely. The cameraman, they show the cameraman wearing his mask. The, the person doing the news report is not wearing her mask, but the cameraman is significantly back about 15 feet and zoomed in on the person doing the filming. Um, I would not say that you guys need to strip in your backyard like I do. I would state that, um, uh, as Patrick stated a minute ago, that uh, you can't just kind of knock this thing off if you got glanced with it. If you walk into someone exhaling, breathing like, this, as I've seen several times, uh, then it's a whole different deal because that person is reaching as deep into the lung as possible and firing whatever is in there at me and at the room. That's the negative pressure room. So what I would state to you is that I agree with both um, uh, Patrick and Brandon on this one and that um, you know even laundering my clothes normally is enough to kill this thing. I just make certain I put a decent amount of soap in there. Now, it seems like it's going to be pretty standard operating procedure that everybody on set is going to be wearing a mask. And so uh, breathing is a bit of a concern. So there's been talk about uh, oxygen machines and, you know, helping that way. What, where does that come into the equation? Brandon, you want to start with that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I haven't heard of any need for an oxygen machine or or you know things like that. Um, having your your face covered, you shouldn't need any any supplemental oxygen into the room or anything like that. Um, as far as I know, it, whatever you know setting you're in, if you have your basic cloth covering or, or a surgical mask, uh, you're you're fine. There's there's going to be enough oxygen in the room uh, for the for the normal healthy uh, you know person. And should they change their mask intermittently then throughout the day? Um, no, the, the, it wouldn't be necessary unless it was contaminated, uh, either you know with contaminated with dirt or you know you're come in contact with someone who is known or suspected with COVID that you know coughs directly on you. Um, unless it's a soiled mask, you don't need to change it. Um, they could wear the same mask um, throughout the day. You know even you know, multiple days, um, depending on, 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 on your, you know, environmental exposure. Dr. Norris, I think I interrupted you there. Go ahead. You had something to say? No, well, basically you're talking about the supplemental oxygen on the set. People become overwhelmed in heat all the time. I would defer to the other two gentlemen who've actually been on sets and treated people uh, at that point. I mean, you always, the, the, the guy on the ground is always the guy you listen to first. And um, oxygen, yeah, uh, if I had somebody who had lung disease like uh, emphysema, but wasn't bad enough, they needed oxygen all the time. Then you put the mask on them. Well, you're not really dropping their oxygen or raising their CO2 that much, but they may become uncomfortable because they're always worried about their breathing. You know how emotion takes a big effect? You got to remember, this disease uses our humanity against us. 
be getting close to other people puts us at risk of getting sick, defending ourselves. I mean, right now, I don't let anyone go into the hospital as visitors. They have to Skype it and so forth. And when people are seriously ill or scared, it's really tough because again, you cannot defend the West Wing of the White House with daily swabs and all the technology from infrared temperature checks continuously and so forth. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's about all I can say on this. Um, Brandon or Pat, either one of you, as set medics, should some of this sanit uh, sanitizing and um, you know that we're talking about that has really been increased, should that fall on the set medic or should there be a safety officer on, on sets, you know, with, with budgets and, and crew sizes that are, that, you know, require that should that fall to a certain person that works with you to make sure those things are staying clean? Want me to answer that or? Sure. Well, we could both. Uh, yeah. You know, I've gone in on productions and in, in my business, I go in as either the medic or sometimes the water safety diver. And when you're trying to help out production at times, you're going to be in the water as a diver and now somebody needs you as a medic and vice versa. So my recommendation is, and, and I've spoken to a couple production managers about this, is the medic will be there to be as helpful as they can. But when you have a set in a different location from where base camp is, and let's just say makeup and hair, or somebody is working back at base camp with the talent, it's, it's hard for the set medic to leave the set to actually go to another location to make sure that people are disinfecting things or they're wearing their mask or things like that. So I've suggested it might be good to have a safety officer or somebody that could be another set of eyes, even though all of us should be backing everybody up, we should all have our backs, but it, it's tough just to let the medic be responsible for all that. So I, I think it should be a, a team of people possibly that would have that responsibility. And just, just uh, to continue on with that, that, that person who would be, you know, the safety officer, you know, that, that should be someone with some sort of, you know, medical background. Um, you know, whether doctor, nurse, paramedic, because um, if we're having them, you know, in charge of, you know, sanitizing and, and, and making sure people are, are keeping their distance and the, and the equipment's being cleaned properly and, and which equipment needs to be cleaned and, and, and how often, um, you know, that person needs to have some sort of, you know, background into what, what, are, you, what are you cleaning and why are you cleaning it? Um, you know, what are we trying to protect? We're trying to protect against a virus. Um, so, you know, that, that safety officer should uh, have a medical background. So we've touched on some of the question and answers uh, that the audience has, has uh, already submitted, but I'm going to go to a couple more here. Uh, we've touched on a couple points within this a little bit. So some of it might be slightly repeating, but just to, to retouch on it, it says, um, and, and Dr. Norris, we'll, we'll start with you on this and what about using ozone generators on closed sets? Studies have shown that ozone can kill SARS, which is similar to coronavirus. Any thoughts? Not enough information. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, there are a lot of studies out there. I mean, let's look at test kits. The FDA announced there's 200 different test kits that they haven't approved but are allowed to be out on the market being sold right now. Uh, a lot of these don't live up to uh, expectations and haven't been studied. I'm going to state to you that I don't, do not expect that a uh, ozone generator is going to do much harm, but I can't tell you that it's going to make a huge difference. Again, if the human factor comes in and if it makes somebody feel better, that's good. But if it comes in like the gloves do and people now say they can get this close to you, that's not going to be a positive. So it's um, something that I just don't have data on, wish I did. Uh, and Patrick, I'll ask you this one, but I, I, all three of you can uh, jump in if you want. Is a face shield as good of protection as a mask? Is it, it will allow for clearer speech, easier to breathe, et cetera? No, I don't have the, the data on that. I, I look at it as the shield will protect your eyes to where a mask will not. Now, 
a shield is going to protect you from splashing. Uh, you, you, the mask, like I say, is going to seal to where you're not going to breathe anything in, but it's not going to protect your eyes to where I think the opposite with the mask is you're going to be able to kind of breathe things in from around the underneath side of it or the outside of it. So you don't have a complete, I, I think if you, you wore both, you would have a lot of protection, but I, I think each one of them has their, their own protection and why they're, they're actually made and they're worn. So, I mean, that's my take on that. Yeah. Can I'll, I um, jump in? Oh, okay. All, all right. Ahead, uh, first of all, the mask. Okay. It's a typical hospital mask uh, in the operating room. We don't wear it because we're worried about catching the appendicitis of the gallbladder from the person we're operating on. We're worried about the droplets that was said earlier, leaving my mouth, carrying uh, with them. Uh, the droplets are vapor. They are um, the vehicle. So as I exhale, you can feel the moisture on the hand, right? Put the mask in front of you. Not the same. What I'm doing is I'm catching vehicles going through the mask, carrying whatever biomass I happen to have that I'm going to share. I'm, I'm not passing that out to the people around me. So when I wear a mask, that stops me from sharing me with you. But when I, um, but when uh, it doesn't stop the little bitty vapors, the small ones, not the big droplets, the little ones from getting out and coming across. When we go to intubate a patient, put them on life support, tube them, right? Like in the movies, we're going to put you on life support. What we end up doing is we put on the mask so that, uh, and it's not this, it's the full-blown N95 because we want to filter what's coming at us. We want, they talk about uh, having uh, fit tested. Does the mask fit your face the way it needs to? If I have big cheeks up here, it's not going to fit right necessarily like trying to put on a pair of jeans, you need the right size pair. Now, the face shield, which you can see I have one standing by, literally protects my eyes. So if I'm going to go close to you like this, and I want to not catch an eye, a, a droplet right there in my eye, which will connect through to my nose. Anyone who cries knows your nose runs because there's a drain pipe connecting the two. You're basically absorbing the virus if you get hit in the eye with it. So if I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get point blank with somebody to intubate them, the where it was mentioning aerosolizing when OSHA was discussed earlier. If I'm gonna get close to your aerosol, I want a mask on and I want a shield. But as far as the shield's concerned for if you're running your set, what's happening then is you're still spraying into the environment, uh, the droplets and so forth. You're not trying to catch it. Do the experiment, put the mask on, blow into your hand and then do it without and notice the difference in humidity. It's that simple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brandon, go ahead. No, I was just, well, I was going to touch on basically, uh, you know, Dr. John, he, he had said everything. Um, the shield, did, that, that's for us. Uh, in addition to, you know, the N95, that's for us when we're doing the, the high risk, you know, the aerosol, the procedures that cause aerosolization when we're innovating, when we're doing things like that. So the face shield, that's not for, for daily use in a low risk environment like our, like our production sets. Would you uh, suggest though that people wear protective eye eyewear just to help? Yeah, that's that's not a bad suggestion. Um, you know, some sunglasses, you know, clear, you know, eye protection. It's it again. We need to we need to look back at we're we're wearing the mask not necessarily to to protect ourselves. The surgical mask. Um, you know, we're looking at the the you know, not, not the healthcare setting, the, the, the general uh, uh, population, you know, we don't want the droplets to get out, right? So that's why we were in the mask. Um, the eye protection of just, you know, some safety glasses or sunglasses, that is a good idea. It will make people feel safer. Um, it, it, it's something that could help, but again, we don't need the, the, the full face shield. That's, that's not for, for, for the regular people on the set. And Brandon, sticking with you, something that we, we talked about in the last town hall, uh, and I don't think we asked you specifically, but there's talk about uh, departments working in pods where 
uh, a department will stay together and essentially not cross paths with other departments. If there is somebody that has to cross paths, it'd be like one person as opposed to lots of groups working together. Uh, from your time on set, does that seem like a, a good recommendation? Yeah, that's, that's, not a, that's not a bad idea um, as far as, you know, ways to lower our risk. Um, one concern would be that you get a little false sense of security and, and within your pod, you're kind of breaking that social distancing rule and, oh, no, we're, we're all together, we're, we're cool, we'll just send our one person out and, and that's the one that needs to be protected and, and wear the mask. Um, that would be one fear of mine that, you, you know, you develop that false sense of security. It's, it's a good recommendation in the sense that we're limiting contact, you know, unnecessary contact uh, with people on the set. Again, just to, it reduces, you know, the risk just a little bit. Um, you know, an example from, from us out in the field at the, you know, with the fire department, we're, we're limiting people that come into our station. We're trying to, you know, keep our station as one pod, I guess, you know, normally you would have, you know, a bunch of different units interacting and, and maybe, you know, hanging out at, at different firehouses and we put a stop to that. Um, we still practice, you know, the social distancing and stuff amongst ourselves, but we're, we're just trying to limit interaction. You want to uh, remove the unnecessary interaction uh, if possible. Patrick, as you know, a lot of filming is done in private locations um, and, you know, per people's homes and that, that allow people to go in and film. Should a home or a location be completely sanitized before filming there? And, and do you have any, if so, do you have any recommendations as the best way to go about that? Well, it's, again, we're trying to get everybody back to work. We're trying to eliminate passing this uh, virus. So it would be a good idea to sanitize it. Now, as far as what's the best sanitizers to use, I cannot give you that answer because again, just looking at the data that's out there, there's a lot of different things that people recommend. And again, when you get to the CDC and OSHA and all this, they, they kind of give a vague, uh, that they'll say disinfect this or sanitize this, but they don't give you a recommendation on what's the best to use. And talking with Brandon prior to this, uh, meeting that the thing that uh, Dr. Norris mentioned when you asked him about the the ozone and all this certain things that's when I mean I was even educated as far as okay certain things have EPA registration numbers for sanitizing surfaces and all that but then you get into the FDA is approving what actually gets to get put on the body so there there is you know, to me, a lot more information that we need to learn about this type of thing. And Dr. Norris, I wanted to ask you, even though, you know, you don't necessarily have a lot of experience on a production set, uh, there's a lot of discussion between uh, the risk and benefit of filming interior locations versus exterior locations. From a medical perspective, uh, where, where would you recommend people try and, you know, uh, lean towards at this point? Okay. Um, out, outside with a light breeze, not being down straight, downwind is a good place to be. But if you have to be indoors, as big ventilated as possible. Um, that's basically it. Being in a tight room like a closet uh, is not going to be, um, it's going to be a lot more easy to get contaminated with somebody else's uh, issues. And I wanted to ask another question about masks. Obviously, the N95 is is you know mm -hmm. the the top level, um, but for a low risk industry like ours, you know, are there varying levels of masks, uh, cloth versus fabric, you know, or, or you know the medical ones versus want some something that can be made at home? What are your thoughts on that? I got the I have the cheapest test you can do for yourself, blowing your hand the same way I said a minute ago. Give yourself the same amount and then put on just the cloth, you know, like a scarf or whatever, and feel the difference in moisture. Remember, the vehicle that the virus is carried in is the vapor, the droplet. So when you exhale, you can see. 
One of the biggest concerns is this N95. Notice this thing in the front, that's a vent. Now, this mask is designed for people who are like cutting plywood, cutting pressure treated lumber, because what it does is it catches what's trying, what, when the guy inhales, it's catching whatever is in the air and trying to filter it out 95% of the time. The, this box in the front is an exhale valve. So when I exhale, I'm not filtering my air. It's going out as if I, like this. And what happens then is I'm not protecting the people around me when I have this thing on. I am basically protecting myself from sawdust and from uh, things like if I went into a COVID unit, if I was forced to wear this thing, I would wear it because I would be concerned about catching things from the air around me. I would not be as concerned about infecting them, you know, because they're already infected. But uh, you have to understand that the most useful tool for telling whether or not your mask is working is So I, I'm not sure who to direct this question to, towards specifically. So anybody asks, there's been a lot of talk about UV lighting and sanitizing. Any thoughts or, or input you could give uh, specifically in sanitizing equipment? Yeah. No, I'll add on to that. that there's nothing I've seen that, that you, you would, I would want to use something to that's listed from from the EPA to disinfect equipment before I use UV light, um, a, 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 bleach, a diluted bleach solution, uh, alcohol based solution. Um, that's what you want to use. Um, you know that, that for me, I haven't seen anything to to show that UV light is going to be uh, uh, effective. Okay, I'll go next. Uh, you can't clean this thing with soap, water, and whatever. As soon as you do, you break down the way it's designed. So there have been, about four weeks ago, you may have noticed in the news that they discussed different ways of trying to re-sanitize masks, including one of the ways they talked about was uh, UV light. And there are a number of companies who put those things out, but I would put them up there at the same level as I do the testing I mentioned before. 200 test kits, all of them saying that they can look at your antibody levels, it doesn't mean that the wavelength of light that they're giving you as far as UV, remember they're all wavelengths, right? Doesn't mean that it's gonna be the most effective. So as it stands right now, I state to you, I cannot comment on any specific brand or model. It's being looked at, I can tell you, and I will echo what Brandon said a second ago. And I know none of you are necessarily uh, educational experts, but we've gotten two different questions that have said, you know, essentially, you know, productions are getting going again. But in addition to, uh, you know, regular production, our organization also represents a number of colleges and universities as well as the students. And so there's concern about uh, educational programs getting back online in terms of you know, they, they all share equipment and they all share edit suites and studio spaces. Um, they don't have the ability to own their own equipment. Is there anything you could recommend or, uh, you know, give them a, a sense of, of how they should be proceeding? I, I can respond to that first because I taught at um, the New Jersey Medical School for uh, 10 years. I was the director of the primary care group. I was the associate medical director of the university hospital. I have uh, taught thousands of students. And if you think about it, the stuff we use, we teach them infectious disease. So therefore, yeah, I got a little bit of experience with your question. And um, one of the things is what you stated. Uh, the students are all made to buy their own equipment right away. Now that may not be possible with the uh, film students. Uh, a lot of your stuff is very expensive and it has to be specific. It can't be as generic as what I have in my house call bag. Um, what I will state to you is that hand washing, uh, some, some equipment, uh, like Patrick was starting to say earlier about, um, and how Brandon jumped in, um, you know, different substances have different cleaning methods. You don't bleach somebody's silk scarf, you know, as an example, it won't be a wonderful outcome. When it comes down to it, there are people who run dry cleaning services tell you they have different methods and different chemicals for different things. So as it stands right now, what I would state to you is that uh, when, when the equipment is purchased, 
it should be clarified as to how you maintain the equipment. And when it comes to others using it, wash your hands, wash your hands, and wash your hands. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, go back to basics with that. Uh, look at the, the environment that they're going to be, uh, you know, I guess, learning in. It's a low risk environment. So again, same procedures. Those people need to be, uh, you know, practicing the, the personal responsibility um, of wearing their mask, washing their hands. Um, if they're going to be sharing the equipment, wipe it down with an EPA approved uh, disinfectant and wipe it down according to the manufacturer's, you know, specifications. Um, they're going to have uh, instructions or recommendations on how to clean their equipment. So we go back to the responsibility of the different educational institutions that if they're going to have, you know, shared rooms or shared equipment, we need to now make sure before a new group of students come in that we've properly wiped down uh, and cleaned this equipment that when the students are there or when the people are there, it's again, it's a low risk environment. So what are our, you know, protocols for the low risk environment? How do we have, you know, what kind of personal protection uh, guidelines are we given? All right, it's the mask, it's the constant washing of the hands. Um, it, you know, just go back to the basic. It, uh, treat it as a low risk environment and clean the equipment how, you know, it needs to be, you know, properly cleaned. And Dr. Norris, uh, I got, I've gotten a couple of questions about if someone tests positive and they go through the process and then they eventually, uh, the virus runs its course and they test negative, how susceptible or are they susceptible to getting reinfected? Okay. That goes back to the aircraft carrier Roosevelt as a recent in the news example of what you're asking me. The carrier had up to a thousand of its 5,000 crewmen uh, positive for COVID-19. Out of those, according to news releases, because our warships do not give papers on what goes on on them, um, the news report stated that 60% of the people initially had no symptoms that they found these 600 people by swabbing the entire crew, that 400 of them had an influenza-like illness, and that led the carrier to be identified as a uh, contaminated area. Then what happened was they all swabbed negative based on a recent report. And when the ship pulled into Guam and uh, did whatever it did there, they went to go ahead and leave Guam again. And 13 members of the crew complained of influenza-like illnesses again, people who had been positive before. So they swabbed those people and, and who had been negative, and now they got virus again. Now, that we've heard reports of that coming out of Wuhan. We've heard reports of that out of South Korea. And South Korea, I have to tell you, is one of the most aggressive and most capable groups in the world. They actually fought uh, MERS a uh, cousin of uh, COVID-19 in 2015. It's the reason why they're so all over this and the reason why they stayed open and have a um, death rate as low as they have because they are very aggressive uh, testers and contact tracers. But when you talk about the recurrence, right now the literature is stating we don't know for certain whether they are reactivating like, um, like a cold sore. You know, a person gets infected with a cold sore because they're all blistered and this doesn't look so good. You can check their blood and the blood shows that they have the antibodies and then this goes away and then it comes back again and then it goes away and it comes back and there's still antibodies. And then um, who's gonna go and kiss someone who's got this big fungating thing, ulcer, angry on their face? No, but yet it keeps getting passed. So you're still infectious when you don't even have the lesion up there. So right now, people don't know if it reactivates, you get reinfected, or it's just cycling. So when it comes down to it, I'm going to say to you that I can't comment more than we have questions, and it's going to be the CDC, NIH, World Health Organization, South Korea, Switzerland, whoever, who's going to help us answer this. But it's going to take time to be sure of your answer. Well, that brings us to the end of our, our hour. And so I want to thank our panelists for spending time with us today and thank all of you uh, for watching. Just like our initial uh, town hall, the goal is to put, post the video from this discussion on our YouTube channel and social media pages. 
so people can watch if they weren't able to participate. We're continuing to take suggestions and incorporating them into our overall recommendations document. So an updated version will be available soon. And again, the document is a list of recommendations, not mandates or requirements. Those will come from the unions, the guilds, the studios, and, and possibly local film commissions. Once again, I wanna thank, uh, sincerely thank all of our Film Florida members. As I mentioned the last time, we're a volunteer driven organization that's funded entirely by our members. So without ongoing support from, from those members, we don't exist. Uh, if you're not a member of Film Florida, if not now, when the time is right, hopefully you'll consider joining the organization at filmflorida.org. Uh, annual student memberships are just $25. Individual memberships are just $75. And corporate memberships start at 500. Keep, uh, keeping up with everything we're doing on social media, please, uh, you know, on our Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And finally, check out the Film Florida podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher, and the iHeartRadio app. And thanks again for watching. Please stay healthy and safe. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.